in Ephesians chapter 6. Last week we looked at verses 1, 2, and 3 as far as the twofold responsibility of children. And that responsibility was that children, first of all, are told to obey their parents. And then that obedience is followed up with the grand reality that we find inside of the Ten Commandments. They are to honor both their mother and their father. And, and so the, the twofold responsibility is that children are not just called upon to do what their parents have instructed them to do, but they're to honor their parents as they are doing uh, those express commands. So uh, the idea is that when we tell our children to clean their room, they don't clean their room, rolling their eyes and kicking and fighting and saying all kinds of words inside of their mind. I know no children here at Fellowship Baptist Church have ever done that, right? Uh, but uh, it's, it's to clean the room uh, externally and internally at the same time. Uh, and so there's, there's responsibility. This morning we're going to turn our attention to verse number four, which gives to us the flip side of the coin, that of parental responsibility. There's a grave responsibility that is entrusted uh, to parents. The, the, the Bible uh, tells us that children are a heritage from the Lord. They are a gift from God. And when you stop and think about how many uh, people there are, how many uh, married adults there are in this world that would love to have children of their own and, and have not been able to do so. And yet God has blessed so many of us with children. And, and that, that, that comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. And, uh, and so the Lord is going to reveal that to us here uh, this morning in our setting. Verse number four, let's read it together and then we'll pray again. The Bible says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Could we read that again together this morning? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we, we do love you, and we thank you for this privilege of meeting here this morning. And, and our prayer at, at this point in time is, is short and very specific. Uh, we desire for you to bless your word as it goes out into the congregation here today. Would it settle upon listening ears and, and lives that sit ready to obey the word of God? So we pray for your attendance upon that, your help. Uh, please use your word to transform our lives for our benefit and for your supreme glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the command that we come to here in Ephesians 6 and verse number 4 would have probably been uh, a huge surprise for the majority of those living in Roman provinces, as was the city of Ephesus inside of Paul's day. Uh, in, in Roman society, and, and filtered out through all of its various provinces, the family structure had almost entirely vanished away from societies. And mutual love among individual family members had all but disappeared. The, the family, as you and I have been raised to understand it and to appreciate it, was not a very prevalent part of society 2,000 years ago in the area of, of Palestine and, and reaching further beyond those boundaries. Um, th there was, in effect, a Roman law card, called, card, uh, amen. Uh, there was a Roman law called Partia uh, Potestas. I always get nervous when I, I gotta uh, use a, sort of a, another language there, all right? Uh, Partia Potestas uh, was a law that, uh, that, that, that made it a governing principle giving the father life and death power over slaves and virtually over his entire household. And so what this law meant was that at any given point in time, a father inside of a home could take his slaves or anyone else, part of his family, including his wife and his children, and he could sell them as a slave to someone else, or he could even go as far as to kill them all without being held accountable for his actions. Uh, in fact, newborn babies oftentimes were, uh, were brought and laid down at the feet of their fathers. 
And if the father would, would take up the newborn baby and hold it in his arms, then the child was allowed to stay in the family and be reared appropriately. But if the father of that newborn baby who had been laid at his feet was to turn away and walk away from that child, then that newborn baby was discarded in any manner, uh, maybe put to death, uh, maybe sold on the auction block. In fact, uh, every evening inside of strict cities, inside of that society, uh, not, not every week, not once a month or once a year, but every night you could gather around what, what we would call the town hall and all the children who had been discarded throughout that day were brought there to town hall and you could purchase those children for the purposes of making them slaves or prostitutes. Um, Seneca, who was a, a Roman statesman during the, the time of the Apostle Paul's writing here, uh, is quoted as such. He said, we slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, we plunge a knife into a sick cow, children born weak or deformed, we drown. Uh, that shows the bleak uh, outlook on the familial structure inside of Paul's day. It was virtually non-existence with, with very little what, what the Bible calls natural affection. Uh, that is a, a God-given love and appreciation for, for your entire family, especially those of your own immediate household. It would be very easy for us 2,000 years later in American society to sit in judgment of uh, that, uh, that particular form of culture and society. But the reality is that we're not much better in our present day, even inside of America. In fact, it is reported in the year 2019 that some 629,898 abortions took place in the United States of America just in one year. That's the reported total of the abortions that took place. And by and large, despite whatever side of the political realm that you're on, by and large, those are just uh, either both or one of the parents simply saying, we're not interested in having this child. Uh, the primary cause, I thought this was interesting, the primary cause for children being raised in foster care inside of America is not divorce among the parents, it's not financial hardships. Uh, if that were the case, then um, we wouldn't have any children, uh, me and Amber. Uh, and, and those being raised in foster care are not even due to the death of the parents, but for the simple reason of disinterest. People have children, and they simply are not interested in taking care of them, and so they either give them or sell them in some rights to some other third party. There is even a disinterest in being parents in 2022. And so uh, the apostle here inside of Ephesians 6 and verse number 4 is, is pointing out to us that there's not only a responsibility that children have to their parents, but there is equally a responsibility of parents to their children. And that's really captured for us if you look in verse number 4. Paul says, if you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, and then he makes this statement, but bring them up. There's, there's, there's a command that you and I don't even pay attention to a lot of times when we, when we look at this verse. But, but Paul is speaking something uh, of a shock into this society that, that parents have just, a much, uh, just as much of a responsibility to raise their children, to bring their children up. In other words, not to discard them, not to, not to uh, uh, let them just be taken down to town, town hall and sold or drowned or, or, or any way. Uh, be, be put off into someone else's sphere of responsibility. But it is the absolute God-given responsibility of every parent to bring up their children. And then he goes as far as to say, both in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Now, verse number four here is specifically addressed to fathers. You'll see that inside of your authorized version of, of the Bible. And this is rightly done. And, it, and it's rightly done because the primary role of the father is to function as the head of the family. That doesn't mean that the father is more important. That doesn't mean that he holds more value. But it just means uh, in the... Um, 
in the arena of the family government that God has established that the Father reigns supremely. And that's, that's denoted as being a patriarchal society instead of a matriarchal society. Uh, and patriarchal is really what you find all the way back inside of the Bible with Adam being given a headship over Eve. And so when Eve sins, it doesn't plummet all of humanity into the curse of sin. But when Adam sins, as both the patriarchal head of the family and as the uh, federal head over all of humanity, he plummets all of humanity into sin, which is why Paul could say in Romans 5 and verse number 12, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. And so, and so you have this idea, even in verse number 4, of a patriarchal society that's ordained by God. Now, I would like to point out here that the word fathers is derived from a Greek word, uh, patris, uh, which is actually in the scriptures also translated to refer to both parents. In fact, over in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about Moses and how Moses was taken, you remember there had been a decree from Pharaoh that, that all of, the, all of the, the male children were going to be, uh, all of the Hebrew uh, children were going to be slaughtered, that, that Moses' parents uh, took him and they made this ark of bulrushes. And, uh, and, and they, they took him and they floated him down the river there. And so Hebrews 11 verse 23 attributes that action not to the father and not just to the mother, but it uses the same word that's used for fathers here, but, but the Bible denotes it as being both parents' involvement, all right? And so I wanted to point that out because it is the father who is uh, the, the head. It's the father who is the dominant figure uh, inside of the home, and so he is more than likely the, the probable cause in most instances of provoking anger in the life of a child, but, it, but it's, not, it's not his only uh, opportunity, or he's not the only one that has the opportunity to, to do that. Uh, this idea of provoking children to wrath is not just a mistake that the fathers inside of the home can make, but it's a dual uh, uh, opportunity, if you will. I don't know if you should look at provoking your children to wrath as an opportunity, uh, but, uh, but, but both parents. The, the mother is just as capable inside of the home as provoking her children to wrath, just as the father is capable of doing that. So just understand that as you come into verse number four, I think it's absolutely right that it's addressed to fathers because fathers are the head of the home and therefore they give an account of the entire family structure. Uh, but, but fathers don't share in this responsibility all by themselves. This is a shared responsibility. And for those of you that are maybe uh, uh, parents inside of a home where, where you're the only parent and maybe you're a mother trying to raise children inside of your home, of course this would be uh, superiorly uh, applicable to your own situation, that you are never, uh, you are to strive to never to provoke your children unto wrath, all right? And so the idea, what, what, is that, what does that even mean? Because we don't use that kind of terminology in our day. We don't, um, I'm just guessing if you go to some class to learn how to be a better parent, uh, the psychologist probably isn't going to use those exact uh, words to you, don't provoke your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so that needs a little clarifying for us inside of our society. What, what does it mean? What's the idea? And, and what we find is the idea of provoking children to wrath is obviously a mistake of parenting that, that goes as far as to cause a deep-seated anger and even a resentment among your children that will eventually spill over into your children, not really caring about you as their parents, nor of what you think or what you have to say. There's, there's what's trying to be stopped inside of this commandment. As Paul, under divine inspiration, is writing to parents, he's saying, here, don't do this. Don't, 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 don't rear your children in such a way. Don't be involved in your children's life in such a way that you're going to push them to a place where they are angry towards you uh, and, and have a deep-seated resentment towards you, and they eventually wind up in a place where they care nothing for you or what you have to say. Let, let, let me just... Let me just go ahead and, and clarify this. It doesn't matter what kind of convictions or standards or beliefs or what, what system of theology that we align ourselves to. We can be absolutely right in all of the cardinal doctrines of the Word of God. But if I lose the privilege of, of being a, 
a, a instrument of influence in my children's life, where's the profit? Where's the profit? And I, I think that's a, a huge tone here of the, of the Apostle Paul is he's, he's pleading with parents, don't lose your ability to, to speak into your children's life. I oftentimes think about it in, in this regard, and I think we looked at it maybe last Sunday uh, with, uh, with, with, with Solomon saying to his son in the book of Proverbs, and he says, my son, give me your heart. And what Solomon was hoping for is, is that, his, that, that the relationship that he shared with his son would always be a sort of relationship where he could always influence Rehoboam. He, he, he wanted, at, at that time in his life, he wanted a relationship where he could speak advice into his son's life and his son would at least listen to it and, and, and weigh it out in order to be able to make appropriate decisions in his life. And so there's the command for us. As parents, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't mess up the relationship that you have with your children to where you lose influence. Because if you lose influence, they're going to be influenced by someone else. And so fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to wrath. Which, which kind of brings us into another realm of questions that we're not going to be able, be able to deal with exhaustively uh, this morning. But I do want to deal with, with several of them just for our, our benefit to at least kind of head us in the right direction. And that question would, would be this. In what ways then can I be guilty of provoking my children to wrath? Because I definitely, as a, as a father and as a parent, I definitely don't want to do that, right? And I'm sure everyone here that's a parent would say yes and amen to that. We don't want to get to that place where we lose uh, to the, the, the power of influence in our children's life because we have the incredible responsibility to bring them up, to raise them. Uh, we'll see in a little while in Proverbs 22, we're to train up our children in the way they should go. And so that's a tremendous amount of responsibility, but I can't do that if I lose the ability to influence them. And, and so let's, let's just take some time this morning to point out uh, maybe seven, eight, nine ways how we can be guilty of doing this. And, and maybe just the mentioning of them will help us kind of get into another, another, another direction as far as how we're parenting. So let's just shoot down the list here. N number one, here's the first way that I thought about that, that we could really provoke our children to wrath. You can have rules that are simply overprotective. All right? And that sounds... Weird, I know, coming from an independent, fundamental, judgmental Baptist. I, I get that. Uh, but there, there is a reality to where parents uh, just invent rules for the sake of inventing rules. And, 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 and I, I, can, I can speak this now uh, from, uh, from experience. I, I used not to be able to do that, but I'm, I'm getting a little bit more experience being, being a parent now. Uh, my son's fixing to turn 14 uh, this year. And, and there's, there's almost this... Uh, this idea, if you're not careful, and you'll all know what I'm talking about, to, to where you want to be, well, just that, over, overprotective. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fear where you want to retain control. And, and you think is, that, that, you, you know, you, know you, you get to a place where you think what you think is the only thing that matters. And, and you almost view, <laughs> and children don't really help us with this, do they? But you almost view that your children don't know anything. Does anybody else feel like that every once in a while? And so you have to think on their behalf. And that's true. That's true when they're smaller. Uh, you have to think. I, I think that was the, the worst time for us, uh, me and Amber, being, being parents. We hated that, that time period uh, of, of where they couldn't talk to you. Uh, we don't hate it as much now, I don't think. <laughs> but we hated that time period because they couldn't tell you how they were feeling. Now my daughter never tells me, or never stops telling me how she feels. Uh, but, but, but they can't. You, know, if, uh, you, you can tell. Is it your stomach that's hurting? Is it your head? Or did you touch something? Or did you eat something? Or, or you, just, you just couldn't tell necessarily what, what was wrong with them. They couldn't communicate uh, that to you. And so you have to think for them. You have to look at all the signs. And, and you are the only decision maker uh, you know, in, inside of that relationship. As your children get older... You're, you're able, and I think this is right, you're able to relinquish more, uh, more responsibility in a trustworthy manner. And as long as, as long as they're proving themselves trustworthy, you know, the older they, they, they get. Uh, Amber used to, um, you know, pick out the, the outfits uh, for our kids. And uh, I think that would be kind of weird if you still do that. I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm attacking you. I probably am, but I don't want to sound like it uh, at least. But 
And that would probably be weird for her to go up in my son's room, 14 years old, and, and lay out some plaid outfit where he can match his mother uh, to come to church one day. He probably doesn't necessarily want to, want to do that. And so it, there's the idea. You, you understand that as a child gets older and, and you've done your job as a parent to where that child is, is trustworthy, if you retain and never pass along any sort of trust and reliability to that child. What you're going to notice is that everything's been going great. And when you reach that plateau to where you shouldn't be as overprotective as you once were, you're going to notice, you're going to notice kind of a, a dip down if, if you're not careful because that child eventually is going to reach a place where they should be acting a little bit more independently and they're not able to. And, and the, the danger there is that that child is going to begin to resent its parents. We, we don't have time to deal with all of those like that. I didn't intend on, on doing that, but Brother Josh looked at me weird and I had to keep going, all right? Number two, here's the second one, overly bragging on one child while ignoring others. And we could laugh at that, but that is, that is true. And, and there's biblical, actually biblical examples of that. You, you probably thought as soon as I said that, uh, if you're biblically a student, you, you probably thought about Joseph, right? Um, the rest of Joseph's brothers despised him and really took beef with their father over the reality that, that Jacob favored Joseph over all his other uh, brothers. And that, that, that causes a huge problem uh, in, inside of a family. Number three, too much pushing for success. And, and the idea here is that we are, as parents, we can, if we're not careful, we'll never be satisfied. In the realm of academia, uh, you're never satisfied with the performance of your children. They're never smart enough. Here's, here's the reality that, 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 that folks have to learn. Everybody's not an Einstein. All right? Stop looking at me. All right? Everybody's not. We're, we're, not as, we're not all as smart as everybody else. I know I'm not. And, uh, you know, everybody's just not there. And, uh, and, and in the realm of athletics, everybody's not a Michael Jordan. In fact, the majority, so y'all didn't say, everybody didn't say amen to that. You jumped on the Einstein, but everybody thinks they're an athlete in today's, uh, in today's world. The reality is, is your children probably are never going to make it to the major leagues or even the minor leagues uh, more, more than likely. And, and even if they do, that's not the totality of their existence. But, but we live, our, our society is plagued. Uh, with that. I, I, I can speak about Eastern North Carolina because I live here and, and we know it, don't we? I mean, their lives, uh, parents' lives revolve and it's like they're living vicariously through their children and they want their children to succeed so much because it's like they're living through their child. Uh, that's, that's weird, <laughs> number one. But, but it also is, is a way that you can provoke your child to wrath because if they can never perform well enough, then, then they, they feel like they never measure up. And, and we could go through other examples, but those are, those are two huge ones uh, for us. Um, number four, just the word discouragement here. And, and in the realm that, that you're never an encouragement and you never compliment your children. I, I believe children need to hear from, from both parents, hey, you're doing a good job. Hey, that's good. I, I'm glad, hey, that's, that's, a, that's a great job that you, that you did on that, all right? Brother Tingen took away us being able to say, I'm proud of you. I can't even say that, all right? And, uh, but, but just being able to, to compliment them, you know, and, instead of just cutting them down. And some parents are like that. Maybe, maybe, maybe some folks here today, I have a tendency to be like that. I'm trying not to look at my wife while I say that, right? But I have a tendency, you know, just to, you know, it's just, you know, you got to remember they're, they're not 37 years old. They don't have the experience they're going to get a lot of bumps and bruises that you and I have in, in our life. And, and that, that, that's what you call life. And, and so you have to realize that. Uh, number five, the word selfishness. Here's a huge one for, for the culture we live in. Some parents treat their children like they're an inconvenience to them. You know, uh, the idea that I can't, you know, I'm a parent and, and I've got these children and I just can't do what I want to do because I've got these children you know, I, I can't go to the gym and work out like I want to because, because I've got to help my children with their homework. I can't, I can't live my life. I can't do this. I can't do that. And children become an inconvenience. And what that, you know, in a, in a parenthetical sense, what that breeds over into is that you just sit your child down in front of a, of a, of a babysitter called a television and there's no telling what kind of influence they're getting just so you can live your own life. Uh, you know, and we live in that, in that culture of you know, it's a microwave kind of life. Everything's fast food. Everything's preset on the microwave. One, two, three, four, five. Just hit the number, and, and it does it so we can get on with our busy lives. 
Uh, parents, we should never be too busy to invest in our, in our children's lives. Uh, number six here, um, unrealistic expectations. And, and, and what I mean by that is not allowing children to be children. Here's, here's, here's a distinguishing in place inside of being the right kind or, or, or if you will, God's kind of parent. And it's, it's being able to distinguish between outright disobedience and childishness. Because contrary to popular belief, children are going to be childish. They're going to say inappropriate things. Uh, they're they're, they're going to they're gonna pick up on words, maybe not from your home, maybe from your home. In, in fact, it may not be from your home, but if I hear your child say a certain word, I'm going to gossip about you probably and tell everybody it probably come from your home. That's a joke, but we all think like that, don't we? We all think, yeah, I knew they were talking like that. And, um, and, and, and stuff. Children are going to do that. They're going to spill things. Uh, you, you know, we've, uh, I've wanted to kill my children over spilling things I never have. Because, you, you, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not right. Children are going to do some childish things. And, and here's the reality for us as well. Just because a child is a teenager, 13 and 14 and 15 years old, doesn't mean that they're an adult. And so they're still going to make wrong decisions. And, and if you try to protect that child in, in a sense that they're never, never even able to make the wrong decisions, one day they're going to be out on their own and they're going to do nothing but make bad decisions decisions all right so so don't have unrealistic expectations well we got time for a, a couple of more number number seven uh here's a here's a bad one making examples out of your children um i i think there's a tendency this probably isn't as, as much as a of an epidemic as some of the others but but sometimes and, and i've seen this inside of a church setting sometimes uh, sometimes real spiritual parents try to make um try to make examples out of their children to try to coach other parents to try to discipline their children sometimes uh, I, I was guilty of this. Uh, Andrew's got a twitch in his life, I think, my son, uh, because I used to I used to do that. I, I fell into that when Andrew was was young. Uh, we, uh, you know, there was there were some folks. They're they're no longer here. If you're wondering, there's others, but they're not here uh, now. They're probably listening. They'll probably listen to this later on. Uh, but but they it, it was just obvious that they lacked certain uh, a measure of of discipline in their own children, and and I thought the way to help them was to overly punish my son. And so he was an experiment child anyway. He was the first one. And so we, we tried that. And, and really, sometimes you can, you can try to make an example out of, out of your children or, or, or even this, again, in kind of a, a parenthetical fashion, try to show you how hard of a parent I am by being real overly disciplinary in, uh, in my child's life in front of you. But it's probably obvious when I'm away from you, I'm not doing that because if I was... If I was that way away from you, then I wouldn't have to be that way in front of you kind of thing. And so um, number eight, uh, here's, here's, a, here's a huge problem as well, producing an overconfidence in our children. I, I don't want to do that either. I don't want to produce an underconfidence. And there's, you know, who said parenting was easy, right? Uh, the person that never had children, I can tell you that. Uh, it, it's, it's hard. And so there are two ditches to this thing. You know, you, you, don't, you don't have a child that's got uh, huge insecure, I- insecurity, you know, uh, feelings, but you also don't want to produce a child that thinks they're better than everybody else at everything else that they do. You don't that. You don't a, you don't a, you don't a, 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 a 10, 12-year-old child walking around talking about, you know, I'm better than you and everything. Nobody wants to see a child uh, do that. You don't, want to, you don't want to have this overconfidence uh, in, in your children. You, you want your child to be loving and kind. You want them, you want them to be... Confident in God, confident in their parents, and confident in the abilities that, that have been entrusted to them, but, but not to the degree that they're prideful uh, in, inside their life. And so those are, those are just eight that, that we have time for. I've, I've actually got 14 written down, but, but just kind of get us started in, in the right direction. Let's, let's be careful because the, the reality is when we do those things, we could be provoking our children. Now, now, we've all messed up probably in a lot of those areas once or twice. And, and I don't think you've ruined your child's life. Some of your children's lives are ruined. I've noticed that. All right? uh, I, don't think, I don't think you've ruined your child's life from messing up once or twice. But it's the repetitive. If we don't break the cycle, we'll deal with that before we close this morning. If we don't break the cycle of that, if we're not astute to pick up on the fact that, that lo and behold, even us as parents can make a mistake every once in a while, then, then we will be guilty of provoking our children to wrath. And here's, here's the problem with the list that I just gave and with a lot of other things that you could probably fill in the blank here. Here's, here's the major problem with all of this. The, the hard part is that a lot of those very things that we just talked about 
are done with the best of intentions by well-meaning parents. In other words, whenever we do those things, whenever we become overprotective or, or whenever, uh, whenever I'm, I'm just, you know, guarding against all of those things or, or I'm bragging on one child and I'm not even paying attention to the fact that I'm not bragging on the other child, playing favorites, uh, if you will, or I'm trying to produce confidence and it laps into overconfidence, I'm not doing those things and you're not doing those things trying to provoke our children to wrath. We have the best of intentions. We think literally that's what's best for them. But we have to be able to take time every once in a while to do what Paul said and examine ourselves. Not just in regards to spirituality, but in regards to parenting. Is what I'm doing as a parent, is it working? Is it, is it the right procedures? Because if it's not, I need to hit the abort button and I need to fix some things inside of my procedures. Now, This all brings us into the positive command. The negative command here is is where Paul tells us what not to do. Do not provoke your children to wrath. All right? Don't do that, Paul says. And so now the positive side of the command. This is what you need to do, Paul says in verse number four. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So so here's here's the first thing for us, uh, parents. We're not to just raise them, but we're to raise them right. And this is a responsibility entrusted to every single parent. We are to raise our children, not in the way we think they should be raised, but in the way God says they should be raised. We have to find out what is the standard of righteousness and then raise them accordingly. We're not just trying to raise our children the way we were raised. We're not just trying to raise our children the way that, that society raises their children. We're trying to raise our children. We should be trying to raise our children the way that God says they should be raised. There's two operative words here, the latter part in this positive command of verse number four. We're to raise them up in the nurture, number one, and the second word is admonition. The word nurture comes from the Greek word paideia. Uh, there's no correlation. I, I tried to make it fit. It made me think of the word paddle, but I couldn't find anything there uh, inside of it. Uh, that's Old Testament and still prevalent in our society. I think every child ought to get whooped, and you spell that with three O's every night before they go to bed. And uh, I think that's right. Uh, uh, of course, he that spares the rod hates his child. Uh, but, but the idea of nurturing isn't, isn't the idea of correction as much as it is education. We're to raise them up in the nurture, in the education of the Lord. That means that you and I, as parents, have the daunting responsibility to educate our children in a way that they will turn out for God. That's pretty serious. That's pretty serious, you know? It's not just teaching them their ABCs. It's not just making sure they can, they can do mathematics or they understand some, some things about, about world history and, and, and American history. It's, it's about making sure that they have the necessary information, the education, to where they can go on and live for God. And listen, that's more of a responsibility today in America than it was 50 years or 100 years ago. Because we live in a day of higher criticism in higher forms of education where, where, where the, the, the public universities and colleges now are a cesspool of individuals who want to discredit the Bible and God and religion altogether. And so that's being crammed down their throats. Uh, public school, in any form of, of, uh, of public education. And, and this lamps over really a discreditation to the Christian faith, even in Christian schools. And, uh, and, and in homeschool, if, if the parents aren't real good Christian, then the whole thing falls apart as well, right? And, and, so, and so, again, the responsibility is not just that we raise them, but that we raise our children to be godly, which means we'll have to nurture them, we'll have to educate them in, in a way that brings them to God. Proverbs 22, verse number 6 is there. Train up a child in the way he should go. Well, what way should every child go? Well, every child should go in their life, the direction of their life should be led to God. That should be it. That should be it. Parents, that should be the singular course that you and I have selected for our children. Not to be the best ballerina. Not to be the best ball player. Not to be the Kobe Bryant. Not to be, not to be the rock star. Not to be the, the glamorous artist. Not, not to be the model, the fashion show person. Not, not to be any of those things. Our desire, our chief desire for our children should be that they turn out for God. And I start with that goal down there. And, and starting down there allows me to spider web off from that and come back this way and see what the best course is to get them there. 
train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the second word here, admonition, nathalgia, in, in the Greek means to place in mind. Here's a little bit more the idea of correction. This deals in the realm of instruction, uh, specifically like, like a rebuke or a warning. Here's where, where we come in, and when a child has messed up, we come in and we educate them that they've made the wrong decision. But that isn't just done with a paddle. That isn't just done with a belt. I think those are great. I, I think God gave us a tool, the rod, and he gave us a place to use at the backside, right? I, I think that's right. But if that's all you have, you don't have very much, all right? And, and so the idea of raising our children up in the way they should go involve, involves both educating them and then being able to re-instruct them when they have done wrong, being able to communicate to them where they have gone wrong and why it's wrong and how to get that right. And so subsequently, all the way back from Ephesians 5 and verse number 18, what we learn here is that the spirit-filled parent will seek to educate and instruct their children so as to lead them to the Lord rather than leading them away from God. That should be our desire this morning. I found a, a quote by uh, Miss uh, Susanna Wesley, who was the father of both Charles and, and John Wesley. Uh, she raised 17 children. I know, you can go ahead and gasp for air. Uh, that's incredible. Different, different time period, uh, but, but still an incredible feat. And, and she raised at least two good ones, didn't she? And, uh, and here's what she had to say about this idea of parenting and making sure that we're, we're, we're bringing our children up to follow after God in their life. Here's what she says, and I quote, The parent who studies to subdue in his child works together with God in the renewing and the saving of a soul. The parent who indulges in the child's self-will does the devil's work, makes religion impractical, impracticable, got it, <laughs> salvation unattainable, and does all that in him lies to damn his child, soul, and body forever. And Miss Susanna captured the exact truth of Holy Scripture that, that if you and I are not parenting correctly, we are working for the devil in assuring that our child's soul will be damned forever to hell. This is more serious than a schedule. This is more serious than a trophy. This is more serious than a certificate. This is the most important thing that you and I have ever been entrusted to do, to, 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 to be in charge as far as responsibility is concerned of another human life and to ensure that that life turns out for God. That's incredible, uh, the privilege and the responsibility at the same time. So, so, so let's, let's, let's look at a few things here, and, and we'll be finished this morning. And, and the question here that we're going to finish on is this. How do I accomplish that, right? I mean, I, I know I'm not supposed to provoke my children to wrath, and we looked at several examples uh, to, to kind of steer clear of in that realm. But now the Bible says that I'm supposed to bring up my children both in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I'm supposed to, supposed to train them up right so that they're not just not an embarrassment to me, right? Uh, there should be a bigger goal in mind, uh, but, but that my children actually turn out for the Lord. I, I want my child, I, I want my son when he's 25 and 35 and 45, I want him to be in a good Bible-believing church. I want, to, I want him to marry a good Christian girl. I, I, want, to, I, want, him to, I want him to be in Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. I want him to have the same uh, godly standards. I want, to, I want him to read his Bible. I want him to do family devotions with his children like we do. That's what we want, right? I want my daughter, I want the same life for my daughter. I want her to turn out for the Lord. So how do we accomplish that? All right? I, I wish I had like a prescriptive kind of thing, like, like take these three pills and if, call me in the morning, right? I don't have that. I don't have that, but I do have just a, a, a few suggestions that, that I think are, are good godly principles from the Word of God that will help us get more in that direction than maybe we are right now, or maybe just reminding us of some things so that we nail them down inside of our life. Number one, here's, here's the first one. Lead by example, right? Lead by example example. I, if I want my children to get to a certain place, the most effective way of getting them there is to show them how to get there by my own example, allowing them to follow. Now, you, you could talk about uh, the chemistry makeup of individuals. 
that there's some leaders and some followers, and that's, that's right. We're, we're, we're not all made the same, and, and there's some that, that are just out front, and there's some that, that you know, that, that should follow. And sometimes you get those roles reser- uh, reversed, reserved, <laughs> uh, reversed. Maybe I shouldn't be a leader. Uh, you get those roles reversed, and you have followers trying to be leaders, and the whole system begins to crumble. And so it's about knowing your place and knowing what God's given to you and getting in that place. Well, here's, the, here's, here's, here's an awesome truth that, that parents are always the leader. All right? And children are always the followers in, in that uh, primitive relationship. Okay? And so if that's true, and I believe it is from the Word of God, then as a parent, I'm always supposed to be leading my children. And they are already created by God, and that's in our favor. They're already created by God to be a follower. That's why they repeat those words. That's why they exhibit the same characteristics uh, you know, if you have a bad temper and you get mad and you hit things, when your child gets mad, guess what they're going to do? But they're not going to sit down and watch Dr. Phil. They're going to get mad and hit things too, right? Uh, that's just, that's the nature of the beast. And so that, that, that really can work to our favor if we're smart about it. I want my children to turn out for God, so I have to lead the way. I can't expect my children to read their Bible every day if daddy's not going to read their Bible every day. I can't expect them to be excited about coming to church if daddy's not excited about coming to church. I can't expect them to, you know, here, here's, here's, here's another reality as far as the church world is, is concerned. We're called sheep, right? We're, 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 we're the sheep of another pasture. And so, and so Jesus is the great shepherd. He's the one that's leading us. And, and what that means is that we're following him. We're, we're not out in front. The, the servant's not greater than his master. And so we're following him. And, and what's, what's really cool about that is even in, 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 in uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural setting, uh, sheep are not driven animals. You don't say sh- to sheep, hey, go over there, and I'll be over there in a minute. Uh, you can, but they're not going to listen. Uh, they follow. The shepherd leads, and the sheep are supposed to follow in, herd in around him, and follow him where he's going. And that's the idea. I- inside of the home, parents, we're the, we're the shepherd, and the children are following us. They're herding in behind us. And so the question becomes for us, where are we leading our children? In our, in our daily decisions, the habits of our life, are they leading our children closer to God or, or are we leading them further away from the Lord? And if you would say neutral, that, that really either or, then of necessity you're leading them further away from God. So lead by example. And then I would just attach that before we move on uh, from it. Don't overly push involvement in this world. Don't overly push that. Don't, don't, don't give your kids the option... Of, of doing this or coming to church. Why, why would you? Why would you do that? On, on, on the premise of almost every single chapter in the Bible, why would you suggest that God could be second place? All right. Uh, no, number two, be, and you have to write this down right if you're taking notes, be as loving as you are stern. And then in parentheses, I want you to write down the word uh, vice versa. All right. It, so be as loving as you are stern. It, it, I say it like that probably just because of who I am. I have a tendency to be more stern. I don't naturally have a smile on my face. I know a lot of you think I do, but I don't. I don't naturally. I, 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 I am an optimistic uh, person. Uh, just don't talk to my closest friends. They may disagree with you. But I just, I'm not naturally inclined uh, that, that way, all right? And so I, I have a tendency to be a little bit more stern. And so I understand that I need to be just as loving as I am stern because it's not all about you better do what I say. But it's about I love you and I care about you and that's why I'm speaking into your life. And by the way, that's the way the Lord operates with us. You love God because he first loved you. We obey God because we love him. Right? If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. And so you have to back up from there. I keep his commandments because I love him. But why do I love him? Well, I love him not because he told me something, but I love him because he showed me how much he loves me. And so you have to love just as much as you have to be stern. But the exact opposite of that is is true as well. You can't throw out sternness. You're, You're not to be your child's just soul best friend. I hope you are friends with your children. And we have a great relationship with, it, with, our, with our children, I think. I think they gossip about us, but, but I think we're pretty close. Um, but but, but you, you, you have, it, at the end of the day, it can't just be I want to be your buddy. Because God hasn't called you to be their buddy. He's called you to be their parent. 
And, and that means you have to know when to put your foot down and when to, when to say, and you can speak the truth in love, but just say, no, we're not going in that direction. And I don't care if everybody else is doing it. And I don't, at the end of the day, I don't care if everybody else is going to look at us weird. Here's where it stops at. Here's where we go no further. And I give you your realm of, of liberties and freedom, but it reaches a point where we go no further. And so you have to be like that, okay? And then here's the last one, and, and we're finished this morning. Uh, make the necessary changes, okay? Now, I, I, I believe uh, when, when I said that, that more than likely what, what you thought is the same thing that I thought. Even, and, and I even know the ending of this thing. Huh. You wish you did because you would know if you were getting close or not. Um, what you probably thought whenever I said make the necessary changes is make the necessary changes in your children's life. And that is true. Children do need a change of direction ever so often. They, they, they do need that. But that's not what I'm talking about. We need to learn how to make the necessary changes in ourself and in our own procedures. Okay? If, if you've been parenting for a certain way all of your children's life and, and your children are heading in the wrong direction at this point. You have to be able to stop and say, hey, maybe it's a little my fault here. Maybe I've been doing something wrong. Maybe something with my attitude, my disposition, maybe something in the way I come across, something in the way I talk. You and I are supposed to be the responsible parties here. And so we have to start with ourselves. I can't hold them accountable until I hold myself accountable, right? And so I need to learn how to make the necessary adjustments you know every once in a while you have you just see this and and again unless somebody kind of calls our attention to it I don't think it's natural for us to think that we want to change I know I never want to change right if you take me to McDonald's I'm going to get the same thing today I got 10 years ago I don't change uh, on on things very easily at all I mean I hate that and uh, I just I'm a creature of habit and 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 I think a lot of us are I, I can prove that to you the hardest thing you ever did in your life was repent you didn't want to turn on yourself. You thought you, thought you were good and you could fix your relationship with God. People very seldom appreciate change. If they like change, there's something wrong with them. All right, just mark them. All right, those aren't normal people. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, there's, there's this idea, of course, then with us, that we want to just say it's everybody else's fault, and therefore it's my children's fault. But I have to be willing to look at my own life and, and, so, and so here's what I'm saying. Sometimes you see the pattern continuing and people not wanting to do that unless it's pointed out, out, out to them. You know, they, they raise two and three, four, five children, whatever the case is. And as the children are getting older, none of the children are turning out for God. And, and, and sometimes it, it laps over in, into generations. And, and you want to stop and think, at what point do you stop and, and think, you know, maybe I'm partially to, to blame here. Maybe I could fix some things. Maybe I haven't done some things exactly right. And just, and just try. Because I, I know this, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same results. Right? You know, the, the guy gets up in the batter's box and, and, he, and he swings the bat at the ball and he, and he misses every time. Well, if the coach doesn't correct some of his bad habits, that's what he's going to do virtually every time he gets up the bat. The worst thing he could do is actually hit a home run one time. We had that happen in our baseball season this last year. I think the one hit that the guy actually had all season, and uh, he hit an in-the-park home run, I think it was. And, I mean, literally, he didn't have one hit the entire season and like, the second to the last game in, uh, in, in the conference. Well, I, I think it was the first game. I don't think he did anything in the conference. Are y'all interested in this or not? And so, and, but, but just on a fluke, it just happened. And so now he's back overly confident in his abilities, even though he's doing everything mechanically wrong. L listen, if, if, every, if you're striking out every up to bat, make whatever change is necessary. Well, make this statement and then, and then we'll pray this morning. I hope this has been a help to you. In, in regards to change, he who is unwilling to change will never change anything, okay? We, I, I know the world of fundamentalism. You know, bless God, I ain't changing, and I'm never changing. I heard that this past week. I ain't never changed in 45 years. Well, that's dumb. You mean you're just as dumb today as you were 45 years ago? Like, of course you ought to change. You ought to learn. You ought to grow. You ought to be able to say every once in a while, hey, I was wrong about that. And, and, and that's the idea of growth. And so he who never changes will never change anything. 
So God help us to be willing to examine our lives, parents, and, and to see, hey, what are the good things? And let's re-up with those. And what are some things that maybe not be working or, or, or real questionable? And, and let's, 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 let's change those out. Let's substitute. Who knows? We might put the guy in off the bench, and we might win the game. So let's put something else in this place and, and try that for a while. All right? Let's stand this morning for prayer.